So Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse uh, 1, we started talking about this a little bit last week. Let's reread uh, these first few verses and have them fresh in our mind, and then we will continue on. Acts 12, beginning in verse 1, says, About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So we spent a while last week talking about Herod and which Herod this was. They all kind of run together, uh, and they're all called Herod. Uh, you know, spell check sometimes will, will hurt you. I was looking back over my notes, and I had a reference to Harold. And I was trying to figure out why I'd put Harold in my notes. And evidently, I'd messed up, and it had auto-corrected to Harold. And uh, so you just never know what you're going to what you're gonna find. Uh, but this is Herod, uh, which was a title. Uh, but... All of these, this family was called Herod. And so now I'm going to start calling them Harold just, just because. Uh, that's kind of how my brain works. Now, the Bible says James was killed with the sword. Now, Eusebius is an early Christian author. He says uh, James was beheaded uh, with the sword. And, of course, that's uninspired. Uh, he's an early Christian author, and he might have known that may have been a, a tradition that was valid. Um, we know Barnabas, of course, was stoned. Uh, there were many ways to kill a man. And the Bible prophesied that Jesus would be crucified, which would be kind of unlikely because the Jews didn't crucify people. Um, but Jesus was prophesied that he would be crucified, and he was. Just another little interesting fact to support inspiration. Uh, the Bible knows what it's talking about, uh, even hundreds of years before the fact. Another thought about inspiration, Luke tells about the death of James in five words in, in the original language. You imagine a novel where one of the main characters is killed off in the middle of the story in five words, and then nothing else is, is ever said about him. That's just crazy. You know, if a guy was writing this, a person was writing this, they would spend a while on that. You know, but the Bible is not written to satisfy our curiosity. It is written for a point, and that's really outside of what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. Uh, we want to know, well, what are the details? How did this happen? And, of course, if man was writing it, you'd have a little bit more about it. And a lot of times we, we come upon these things in the Bible, and, man, I'd like to know how that happened. And at times like this, people say, well, when we get to heaven, we'll just have to ask Paul about that or ask Luke about that. Well, that may be true. We'll have all eternity to do it, right? But then on the other hand, that may not be important at all. Uh, you know, that's something we'd like to know now, but then we may not even care about that. So I don't know. Ted?
right? Okay, so he's asking in verse 4, it mentions the Passover. This is a different year. Of course, Passover would be held every year. So these are, this is probably 10 years after, you know, around 10 years after the time of, of crucifixion of Christ. So, um, you know, every year they had this week of celebration. Passover was one of the three main feasts that the Jews would celebrate, and the men were told to go to Jerusalem to celebrate these, these feasts. And so this whole week, uh, the week of unleavened bread and Passover, they kind of merge together. And very often these phrases are used interchangeably, uh, one to stand for the other or to stand for the whole, the part that stands for the whole. And we do that sometimes. Uh, but, you know, this whole week, and you remember during the Passion Week of Christ, they didn't, the Jews didn't want to kill him during that week. They wanted to wait until the next week. And, of course, we made the point then, Jesus is in charge of the timetable. Um, Jesus is the one pulling the strings. The Bible prophesied that he's going to be our Paschal Lamb, which would have been on that Friday, uh, that it had, to, it had to be on that Friday. So men had planned one thing, and, of course, God had other plans. So here it's the same situation. They've got uh, Peter in prison. They want to wait till after this feast, after everything dies down. During these feast times, all the people would be going to Jerusalem. The size, the population of Jerusalem would swell big time. Uh, you know, you, you can predict millions of, of people there. Uh, during this time also, the rulers would come, the procurators or kings uh, would come to Jerusalem. They would bring in extra Roman soldiers during this time. So, and they would be stationed in Castle Antonia, which is part of the temple complex that, that Herod the Great, uh, this Herod's grandfather, uh, had built, and the Solomon's portico uh, around the outside, the Roman soldiers would walk along the top of that to keep an eye on what's going on. Because if there's going to be any problem with the, you know, the, uh, the Jewish people, and they were a problem people, they, <laughs> there was all the time something going on with these people. Uh, after a while, they're just going to get sick and tired of them, and they're just going to wipe them out uh, in, in about 15 years uh, from this time. So you know, imagine trying to worship, and you've got guards all around and always watching you. you know. Uh, that's just kind of the situation here. He kills James with the sword, and really we don't know anything more about that. Now, James was part of what we call the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Uh, when Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, who did he take? Peter, James, and John. When he went into the inner part of the garden, who did he take? Peter, James, and John. Um, so... When James died, he, this was really something that Jesus had predicted. Uh, you remember James and John's mother asked if her boys could sit on the right and left of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. Now, they were thinking physical kingdom. They were thinking, you know, man, we're going to have a court, and we, I want my boys to be in the important part. And Jesus says uh, in Matthew 20, uh, beginning verse 22, he says, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? 
And they said to him, we are able. He said, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it's been prepared by my father. Well, here is James drinking that same cup, all right, that Jesus predicted. And really, 11 of the 12, you know, tradition says 11 of the 12 apostles were martyrs, uh, were killed for their faith. Uh, John lived to an older age, but he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. So if you had a group of people you wanted to squash, what would you do? Well, you'd find who's the ringleaders. Well, he's already gotten James. And so who's next? Well, let's get Peter. He's part of that inner circle. So Peter's arrested and put into uh, the, what's called the inner prison. Now, this was during the days of unleavened bread, and we've talked about that a minute. Um, in verse 4, if you've got the King James, it will use the word Easter. And this is an unfortunate translation. Uh, every other time, it translates this word as, as uh, Passover, but for some reason, and really we're not sure why, uh, maybe to appease the king, maybe, I don't know. Uh, they use the word Easter instead of the word Passover. Uh, but any other translation, um, modern better translations will say uh, Passover uh, there in verse 4. So Peter is put into what we would call maximum security. Now, prison at this time wasn't like our prisons today. People will be put in prison as punishment today. Where prison during this time, they were put in prison until they decided what the punishment was going to be. <laughs> so there was no such thing as a long-term imprisonment, all right? Uh, you stay there until we decide what we're going to do with you. And while you're in prison, somebody else takes care of you. We're not feeding you, all right? Uh, that's kind of how that works. Um, so here is Peter, and he has assigned 16 men, uh, four squads of four men each, to watch him. So you, you think, well, there's four guys in a squad, and the squads are going to swap out. Uh, and what's going to happen, there's going to be a guy chained to each side of Peter. And imagine, <laughs> then there's going to be another guy at the door, and then another guy at the outer door. So we've got an inner door and outer door, four guys always keeping an eye on, on Peter. Now, why did he do this? It's kind of like Herod says, all right, you local yokels don't know how to keep people in because you remember the apostles had been arrested before and the angel came and let them out and said, go to the temple and start preaching. And the next morning they're out at the temple preaching and by the way, those guys that were in prison, they're not in prison anymore, they're out preaching. And that, you know, so the Jewish council obviously doesn't know how to take care of prisoners. So Herod's going to show him. Betty will show you how he assigned 16 guys just for one man. All right? So it's like he's telling them, you know, you don't know what you're doing. What's the church going to do? Well, the church is not going to mount up <laughs> a uh, vigilante group to go save him, to go rescue him. Uh, they're going to do something. They're going to call on a higher power, and they're going to pray. Uh, so I'd like to read uh, verses 6 down through 17 at this time. Now when, now when, Pe now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Let me read that again. <laughs> he, 
he was sleeping between two soldiers. We're going to come back to that. Bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands and the angel said, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him, but he did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. (laughs) So imagine (laughs) you're chained up between two guards and you're going to be killed the next day. Now, how much sleep would you get? (laughs) It's hard for some people to get much sleep on a good night, you know, with nothing going on. But here he is chained between two guards, and he's sleeping. And he's sleeping so soundly, the angel turns on the light, and that doesn't wake him up. He strikes him on the side to wake him up. And then even still, he's kind of in a daze. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Why in the world did God wait for the last night? (laughs) Peter had been in prison during this week of unleavened bread. Why did he wait for the last night? I don't know. (laughs) This is just another example that God works on his timetable and not on our timetable. Uh, you know, if it was me, I'd say, man, get that guy out of there as soon as possible. Um, but God, he, he, is, he is God. He, he's got his own plans. Um, you, you, don't, you don't tell God what to do. Uh, the church has no way of helping Peter. What are they going to do? They're going to pray. Uh, So you may think, well, if God didn't help James, why is he helping Peter? And you may think, let's put yourself in the situation of the church there. We prayed for James. It didn't help. Why bother praying about Peter? And so, you know, we don't know. Uh, there's, There's a lot of things, of course, that we don't know. Uh, But here, on that very night, when he was going to be brought out on the next day, uh, then the angel comes. Now, it's interesting, this word that's used to strike, that woke up Peter, struck him. The angel strikes, later on is going to strike Herod, and Herod's going to die from it. But it's the same word. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, people think they're going to overcome angels. They're going to they're going to beat angels. I've heard people talk about that, and we're going to we're going to show them who's boss. Uh, when an angel can strike you and you die, um, you're not going to beat an angel. Okay. Uh, so the angel treats Peter uh, like a little child, and you know, of course, the fact that he's sleeping. Shows what? Man, that is trust in the Lord. You know, can you imagine more trust than being able to sleep on the night before your execution? Uh, I can't imagine, all right? But the angel's going to treat Peter like a little child. What do you do with a little child when you wake him up? Okay, get up. It's time to wake up. It's time to dress yourself, put on your shoes, put on your cloak, (laughs) 
and you know, you got to tell them every little thing. And about the time they get out, one block away, the angel disappears. Why did the angel wait for a block? I'm not sure. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the Lord doesn't help you do what you can do on your own. So here, <laughs> after he gets out, they go a little ways, and Peter finds himself alone. You know, then he realizes where he's at, what he's doing, and then he knows, well, this wasn't a dream, this wasn't a vision, this is actually the Lord helping me. So he goes to the house of Mary, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. In this account, you can count seven miracles that happens. The angel appears, of course, that's a miracle. The light is shown in the cell. The chains fall off. The guards don't wake up. They passed another guard at the door, and he didn't know it. They passed another guard at the door. He didn't know it. The iron, bar, iron doors opened on their own accord. Now, these are big, huge doors that one guy couldn't open by himself. So, another, another miracle. And you may read others as you read this. Um, these things happen then. And, of course, what comes to mind, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in G Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. It's just crazy to think Peter's going to be able to leave. But God is able to do far more than we can ask or think. When we pray, sometimes we don't pray big enough. Um, God has that power. All right, and you know, there's one of the songs that uh, Angie has sung on one of those albums. It's the same power that is working in them is working in us, and that's what this verse says, Ephesians three and verse twenty. That power that God has is working in us, and that's a great power, and we don't take advantage of it too often. Um, we don't pray as we should. Um, we need to pray bigger for bigger things to happen. So the angel gets Peter out of prison and goes a block, and Peter comes to himself. Now, before the angel had told Peter and the other apostles, you go preach. Go to the temple and start preaching. This time, the angel didn't say that. So what's he going to do? He's going to hide. <laughs> he's going to go to the house of Mary, and he's going to go into hiding at this point. Now, the house of Mary is verse 12. And let's read, let me advance here. I get talking and forget to advance. Okay. Let's read uh, 12 through 17 in Acts chapter 12. So he realizes where he is, and then verse 12 uh, reads, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel. 
But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. So lots going on here. I'd like to see a movie of this one day. Uh, He goes to the house of Mary. The fact that it's called the house of Mary, what does that tell us? Might be that she's a widow. Uh, Her husband is dead. But that's a gathering place for Christians. All right? Uh, Of course, no church buildings at this time. Uh, If you were going to look for Christians, would you know where to find them? Well, Peter did. uh, And evidently this was a place that they had gathered in the past. So Rhoda is a servant girl. Now, don't be too hard on her. She, she's as shocked as anybody. And sometimes when you are shocked, amazed, you do things that later on, you, why did I do that? Why didn't I open the door, you know? And so she may not have been thinking real clearly. She is happy, surprised, and instead of opening the door, she runs to tell the good news. Oh, well, there's Peter at the door. She recognizes his voice. What does that say? Well, he's been there before. She knew him well, obviously. So she's happy. The people don't believe her. (laughs) They're in there praying for something, and when it happens, they don't believe it. Uh, That's kind of like, you know, the group that gets together to pray for rain, and only one guy brings an umbrella. Uh, when you when you pray for something, you you'd better be careful what you pray for. Uh, the children of Israel said, "You know, we'd rather die in this wilderness or go back to Egypt than go on." And the Lord granted that. All right. So be careful what you pray for. Uh, but they they've got this prayer. They're praying. When it happens, there's Peter at the door. They can't believe it. They, they, no, no, that's not right. So finally, Peter keeps knocking at the door. They go to the door, and they are amazed. Now, Peter, he's on the lamb. He's on the run at this point. He says, be quiet, guys. Don't wake up the neighbors. Why? They're making a lot of racket. All right? So... Picture, you know, the, the houses of this time. It would be, you know, uh, like a U-shape with a courtyard in the middle. Think of the house on uh, Ben-Hur, if you remember that house. Uh, that, you know, if that picture in my mind, I use that with the high priest house, and I use it with here. So there's a, a door there that would be on the street uh, in the in the courtyard. They'd have a little courtyard and the house would be around it. So that's like the outer gate. And that's where this servant girl, here's Peter, but she doesn't see him, but she doesn't open the door. All right. So he says, tell this to James and the brothers. So probably the other apostles. Uh, James wasn't there. Uh, He was at another place, and then he takes off. Now, after this story, we're not going to hear just a lot about Peter. Um, The page is going to turn, and and we're going to focus on on Paul uh, after this. So that's, he's going to make another appearance at the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, We will see Peter, but largely we'll be focusing on, on Paul after this. Um, other thoughts before we go on? All 
All right, hold that thought, and I'll come back to you. So he's saying um, Jesus had an inner circle. Uh, You can't be close, personal, intimate friends with hundreds of people. It's just just impossible. Uh, But we need to have an inner circle of people that we're trying to help and encourage and even call, make them accountable for one another. And I want you to hold me accountable uh, is the idea. And so Jesus, he had an inner circle, all right? And, you know, he, he loved, of course, every one of them, but he was especially close to his inner circle. All right, next. All right, I can't repeat all that. <laughs> that was too good, but it was long. I can't repeat all that. It's a wonderful thing he mentioned. Why did God save Peter, but he didn't save James? And we don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, and you, know, you look at all the bad things that happened to different characters, and he mentioned Joseph. Uh, man, terrible things happened to him. Uh, devastating events, but he kept going, you know. But often we don't know why, and often we want to ask God, well, why? And, and we don't know. Uh, but we do know, you know, that just like Peter, he knew what was going on. He trusted in God enough to be able to sleep on the night before his execution. You know, we need to trust God. And we can't expect to go through life without tragedy, without just devastating things. Um, That's unrealistic, he said, and I think that makes a good point. Uh, We don't always know why. Real loud. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't know. Evidently, uh, they were finished, <laughs> whether they were or not. <laughs> uh, you know, is there a predetermined set of things that we need to do? And, you know, that gets into, you know, what's predetermined and what's free will. And I don't, I don't always know the answer to that. Um, we need to live every day like that's the end, you know, that we don't know. We don't, we don't know what tomorrow is. It, our life's a vapor, uh, James says. So, you know, is there a preset, you know, thing that we're supposed to do uh, that God has planned for me? I'm, I'm, I wrestle with that myself, you know. Uh, what is it God has for me to do? And, and that's something I, I think we all wrestle with. Uh, but we need to remember, man, our life is short. I may not be able to do this at some point in the future. I better go ahead. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. So 
we can't put things off, you know. And I, I'll confess I'm the world's greatest procrastinator. Uh, I can procrastinate with the best of them. Uh, but, you know, we need to go ahead and, and do these things. It's a good, those, those are some deep questions. Uh, these are good, good things to think about. So Peter doesn't want them to make a lot of noise, but he wants them to go and tell James. Now, this is not uh, James the apostle that was killed, but James the half-brother of Jesus that uh, he wants them to go tell. This James probably wrote the book of James, and he was one of the leaders there in the Jerusalem church. So, you know, tell James and the brothers what's going on. All right, James the Apostle had already been killed at this point. Look in uh, Luke 8, or excuse me, Acts 12, 18. <laughs> and uh, Brother Roper, the author of our book, calls this a classic understatement. And I, I thought that was, that was a good turn of phrase. Uh, in verse 18. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Yeah, that's an understatement. I bet there's a big deal about that. You know, you got this guy in the most secure area, and the next morning he's gone. Yeah, that would be a big deal, all right? Uh, But (laughs) it says no little disturbance. Uh, After Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to to Caesarea and spent time there. So there was probably a big search. And when it says he examined them, that probably means he tortured them. And eventually they would be put to death. A Roman guard, if he let his prisoner escape, he would take that prisoner's place. All right? If the prisoner was slated to be killed, you're going to be killed. So that's how important this was to the guards. Uh, So Herod could only think of two things. Well, there's a miracle happened, or the guards were in conspiracy to let him go. And, of course, that's what he thought. Uh, Herod leaves Judea, Jerusalem, and goes to Caesarea. And, of course, that's where the castle was, and that's where uh, the kings, the procurators, would spend their time. They would only go to Jerusalem during certain times. We're going to talk about the death of Herod now and... You know, the fact that he didn't give God the glory. Um, So here is a map, and if it's me, I love a good map. Here is Palestine. So before, we were focused on Jerusalem, uh, Joppa, and Caesarea. Now we're going to go from Caesarea and go on north to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, We're going to be thinking about those fellas up there. Those are Phoenicians, and of course, they show up. In the Old Testament, they're going to show up here. Uh, They were a seafaring people, uh, fishing and that sort of thing. And they're they're going to be in the next part. There's a great prophecy about Tyre. And if we had an extra hour, I'd love to talk about that. But there's a great prophecy that Alexander the Great helped fulfill. And so uh, I'll just leave that there. But if you want to read about that, uh, that you'll be interested uh, in that. Anyway, so for some reason, Herod is going to be angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. All right, let's read beginning in verse 20. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace 
because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. So we've got Herod, who is the king over this area, and he is killed. Why? He didn't give God the glory. The people are shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And he was eating that up. We mentioned last week how these kings had this so important of themselves. They considered themselves deity. All right. The Caesars did this. The uh, pharaohs in Egypt did this. And so here, you know, you're going you're gonna to have this deity complex. Now, we've got people today, they may not come out and say, I'm a god, but they will say, you know, I'm, I'm an idol. Um, you know, and we idolize people. What does that mean? It's just like other people are worshiping them. All right? And you kind of, you can see that. He has eaten this up. He is enjoying it. Yes, I am a god. And, of course, the angel strikes him, and he, he dies. He is eaten of worms. Um, Josephus writes about this, and, it, and he says it took a couple of days for him to die. Uh, we kind of get the idea that it happens real fast uh, here. Um, but, you know, it may have begun the process. Uh, we don't know. Um, how should we react when people want to praise us like that? All right, you remember just a few chapters ago, Cornelius, what's he do when Peter comes in the room? He falls down to worship him. This is, and we said, this is crazy. Here's a Roman soldier bowing down to a Jew. What's Peter say in Acts 10, verse 26? He says, stand up. I too am a man. All right? Isaiah 42, 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Isaiah 40, uh, 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing, and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Of course, Jesus is described as king of kings and lord of lords. So kings and lords need to remember they have a lord. They have a king. And, of course, the, with John in Revelation, when he falls down to worship the angel, what's the angel say? Man, don't worship me. I'm a servant just like you are. We need to be careful, you know, when people start admiring us as a person, all right? And you can take that and run with it. You know how that goes. Now, later on, when Peter is writing First Peter, do you suppose he has... This story in mind, when he writes in 1 Peter 3, 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Suppose he had this story on his mind. It might be interesting. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas, or excuse me, Barnabas and Saul, he's still Saul at this time, returned to Syria in verse 25. We'd read before they had take, taken the money that had been collected 
in Antioch down to Jerusalem. Now we hear they're going back up. So they had been here during this whole time. And I don't think I'd ever put that together uh, before I started looking at this. They may very well have been in the house of Mary when Peter's out there knocking on the door. Uh, we don't know. It would be interesting to know that. Uh, but they had certainly been in Jerusalem. They had certainly seen and heard about all this that was going on. Uh, so, of course, they would be able to bring that back home uh, when they got there. Uh, what happened to the money <laughs> uh, that they were bringing to the, the Christians in Jerusalem? Well, we don't know. Uh, that's one of the other things. We don't know the rest of that story. Uh, was it well received? Were they, were they thankful? Well, we don't know. Uh, how was it dispersed? We don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we might like to know, uh, but we don't really know. Uh, other thoughts before we move to chapter 13. Now, Lord willing, we'll begin chapter 13 next time. There's, this is going to be a watershed in uh, the book of, of Acts, uh, where before we've been focusing on uh, Peter and Jerusalem is, was our focus. Now we're going to be focusing on Paul and Antioch. Antioch is going to be uh, one of the main cities that we're going to be hearing about. And this is a culmination of the prophecy that Jesus made in Acts 1 and verse 8. Uh, he says, you're going to carry the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I think Brother Lucian, when he was starting uh, many months ago, uh, he mentioned this. Well, this is the third stage right here, uh, beginning in Acts 13. Uh, they began the gospel in Jerusalem. It expanded to Judea and even included Samaria. Uh, then now we're going on out to the ends of the earth. Lord willing, uh, that's where we will begin next week. Thank you, folks.